Euh, bonjour mesdames et messieurs, merci. Euh, euh, C'est un énorme plaisir, je veux le, le dire merci à Belle et aussi à, à Jean-Patrice Jean Jean Saint-Martin qui était très impliqué avec euh, cet événement et aussi Marc Durand qui nous a inspiré beaucoup. Euh, je peux, si vous voulez, euh, poser des questions après en français, Mar Margie et moi on peut répondre en anglais. Mais la discussion serait de, 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 de part en, euh, ouais, tout en, en, en anglais. So, this is a story about a pioneer in hockey, someone who excelled at the game. It's also the story of the women's game and how it became part of Canada's, Canada's lore. Now, I'm not an expert on the, on the women's game, nor do I pretend to be. But I've played with and against women, and I've coached them, and my father coached them back in the 1960s in the Women's Industrial League in Montreal. So I have to say, I'm a huge admirer of women's hockey, and as an author, I felt they should pay tribute to the women's game. And I did that through the best woman hockey player I ever saw in my life. And she's sitting right over there. This is Marjorie Ross. So let's start from the end of the story rather than the beginning. In March 2017, I was looking for stories to augment my original self-published book called The Bowl for a new version. By chance, I joined 4,000 screaming fans uh, and many of them hockey girls with wearing uh, hockey uh, sweaters, hockey jerseys, at the Clarkson Cup uh, game in Ottawa, the Canadian Tire Center. Another million people tuned in on television that day. The favored Calgary Inferno had led the league for most of the season and won the championship the year before. However, in the final game of the regular season, the Canadien, the Montreal Canadien, managed to beat the Inferno, and so they went into the championship with a certain amount of momentum. It was a tight game, and the Montreal get goalie, Charlene Labonte, was fantastic. When the final horn sounded, the Canadien jumped over the boards, threw their sticks and gloves into the air, and raced across the ice to embrace their goalie, who was the first star. As I stood there, I thought about how far the women's game had come, and I became quite emotional. I decided to write a story about women's hockey. So I called up Margie Ross, and I started doing some research to learn more. So let's move to the beginning. The Canadian hockey, as with so many things in hockey, there's a controversy about when the first women's game took place. The Canadian Hockey Association says it took place in Barrie in 1893, whereas the NHL says it took place in, uh, in 1892, sorry, it took place in, 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 uh, in Ottawa at Rideau Hall. Uh, and the reason that it was at Rideau Hall is that the daughter of the Governor General, Isabel Stanley, organized women to play on that rink at the residence uh, in Ottawa. And as of course you know, Lord Stanley's sons started the first, uh, had the first men's hockey game, uh, evidently, at Rideau Hall uh, as well. And of course Lord Stanley gave uh, his, uh, because his sons loved hockey so much and his daughter loved hockey so much, gave a cup, which uh, people are familiar with today. <laughs> yeah. um, the first University of Women's teams uh, it's followed soon after at McGill, Toronto, and uh, <coughs> Queens. The McGill University team was founded in 1894, and uh, Toronto and Queens came after that. Now, by the 1920s, the women's game was popular across the country, especially in universities, but also in small towns. Lady Isabel Meredith donated the Lady Meredith Cup. Her, her husband, was the president of the Bank of Montreal and a philanthropist and a founder of the Montreal General Hospital. Interestingly enough, her cousin, Hugh Allen, who had been the head of the CPR, he, he, he donated the Allen Cup. So there was a big hockey connection in that family. Among the most successful teams, uh, uh, women's teams, was the Prescott, Ontario Rivulettes. They were legendary. Between 1930 and 1940, the team played an estimated 350 games. They lost two and tied three. <laughs> Quite a record. In the war years, the, the game began to decline somewhat, but women, because women were working uh, in, 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 in the war effort, but they were also playing professionally. One standout in Montreal was Hazel Journo, later famous as Hazel McCallion, the mayor of Mississauga, Hurricane Hazel. Hazel was born on the Gaspé coast in Port Daniel, 
And she went to school here in Quebec City at Commissioner's High School. My mother was a classmate. She moved to Montreal to study and work, and she tried out for a women's professional hockey team and was accepted on a team sponsored by Kit Cola, and they paid her $5 a game, which would have been quite a bit of money in those days. Five foot three McCallion was a fast skater and hard shot, according to the Montreal Star, and once lost two teeth after taking a stick to the mouth. She played two seasons before moving to Toronto, where there were no professional hockey teams for women, ending her hockey career. But she continued to play, and as you can see, that's a photo from uh, just a few years ago, uh, with her uh, uh, playing in the Mississauga. Now, the next major female hockey pioneer was Abby Hoffman. In the winter of 1956, nine-year-old Abby Hoffman strapped on skates to play organized hockey for the first time, playing for the Teepees, a boys' team in the Toronto Hockey League. She was a defenseman and named to the league all-star team as Ab Hoffman. When her birth certificate was checked, her coach learned she was not a boy, but a girl. So uh, her, the news spread rapidly, first in the local papers, then the CBC, then New, the New York Times, Newsweek, and Time magazine. She finished the season, and the league quietly passed her rule excluding girls the next year. Meanwhile, she concentrated on competitive swimming, then turning seriously to long distance running, became a world class runner. She medaled at the Pan American Games and the Commonwealth Games and competed in four Olympic Games, carrying the flag at the opening ceremonies in Montreal in 1976. She was instrumental in establishing uh, a uh, national, the original National Women's Hockey Championship, which was named in her honor. So now, let's turn to Marjorie Ross, after we've talked about some other pioneers of hockey. So, there we go. So this is Margie in action. She's 11 years old in this. She's the one with the uh, little uh, red turtleneck. You can see she's got good lateral movement, back and forth, goes into the corners, takes out a couple of guys, gets the puck. <laughs> There I think she I is. fall right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> but moving around. I got up fast, though. <clears throat> you notice we didn't have helmets. Or and she's pretty shy there. She's <laughs> hiding behind the post. <laughs> and there's her coach, some of the players, and then they all come out onto the desk. So, when she was four years old, hockey skates, not figure skates, were what she wanted to wear on the city of Montreal rinks where she played with her older brother Ian. When the Ross family moved a few blocks west to the town of Montreal West in 1956, she decided to sign up for the local hockey league with Ian, who was about a year older. It didn't begin well. One Saturday morning in their first game, her team was skating around the rink, and the kids on the other team started to yell, Hey, he's a girl! He's a girl! She began to cry and jumped over the boards and ran home in her skates. Their home was three blocks away. Her brother Ian saw her take off and he jumped the boards too to run after her. He caught up to her and told her, Come on, Marge, never mind what they're saying. They're idiots. You can play just as good as they can. Show them that. So she went back and showed them. And could she ever play? And you just saw her on the video at 11 years old. By the time she was in peewee hockey, Margie dominated. In 1959, she not only scored more goals than any other player, but her red team won the championship, and she had the winning goal. In the winter of 1960, Margie was leading the league again and had a reputation for being hard-nosed and tough. She wasn't afraid to go into the corners and use her body to get to the puck. My brother played against her, so I saw this. I think she must have knocked him down a couple of times. In later years, Margie dropped hockey for a while, and the boys got bigger and went on to Bantam. And, uh, and midget. In the meantime, she threw herself into swimming and was Quebec champion in the breaststroke in the 1960s, competing with her older uh, sister Donna, who was also a champion who competed in the Commonwealth and Pan American Games. She went to McDonald College uh, for a teaching degree and was a standout in hockey, winning the Women's Team Most Valuable Player Award there. Then there was a break while she figured out her life, and gradually she began to think about hockey again, and it got her back into university.
First it was through George Williams University for a commercial course and then to Loyola College from 1972 to 1974. When the two institutions merged to form Concordia University, she played for the women's team there. Then after graduation, she went to McGill University for further studies and to play for the Martlets. The 1973-74 Loyola Colony's women's hockey team won the Quebec University Athletic Association's championship and were inducted into the Concordia Sports Hall of Fame in 2008. They outscored their opponents 66 to nothing. Marjorie was the league's highest scorer with 9 goals and 11 assists in six games, and Sports Illustrated wrote about the impressive achievements of the team and its goaltender, Janet Norman's nine shutouts. Margie was the MVP on every single team she played on, and yet there was no further level to exhibit her hockey skills, no national team, no Olympics, no other leagues after university. So after graduation from McGill, Margie's restless spirit got the better of her, and she headed north to the Northwest Territories, teaching for several years around Great Slave Lake and playing hockey. In 1992, the International Olympic Committee announced that women's hockey would become an official Olympic sport at the 1998 Games in Nagano. Who could forget watching the Canadian women with tears running down their cheeks after a nail-biter saw them lose to the United States in the gold medal game, 3-1? Nonetheless, the Nagano Games were the beginnings of recognition and respect for women's hockey. In 1993, the first professional league was formed, the National Women's Hockey League, with 17 teams in Quebec, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and Minnesota. Then came the Olympics in Salt Lake City. It was the time for the Americans to cry as Canada vengeance lost in Nagano. As you can see, the record in the Olympics has been extraordinary. The gold medal overtime game in Sochi was unforgettable, while Pyeongchang was admittedly a disappointment. Meanwhile, stars emerged like Haley Wickenheiser, Cassie Campbell, and Danielle Goyette. Wickenheiser's career has been amazing. In November, she'll be the fourth woman inducted into the Hall of Fame, into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Her career began at 15 and ended at 38. She was the first woman to play for a male pro team with H.C. Salamat in Finland. She's now a medical student, uh, inspirational speaker, and assistant director of player development for the Toronto Maple Leafs. In 2007, the Canadian Women's, team, women's League was established with teams in Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, and eventually Alberta. In Ottawa, I was coaching minor hockey and was delighted when several girls came out to play for the Adam League. More and more the sight of girls on boys teams or all girls teams was the rule and not the exception. In a gesture of support for the women's game and with a nod to her long ago predecessor, Lord Stanley, former Governor General Adrian Clarkson donated a trophy to represent supremacy in women's pro hockey. The first Clarkson Cup was won in 2009 by the CWHL's Montreal uh, Stars, and the championship continued in success, success, successive years. From 1990, when there were about 8,000 girls and women registered to play hockey in Canada, to the 90,000 stronger community today, the growth has been continuous. Although the women's game has struggled somewhat this year with the CWHL folding, I think there has to be a glowing future for the game, given the huge participation of girls and the increased level of competition. And it's thanks to so many extraordinary women like Isabel Stanley, Hazel McCallion, Abby Hoffman, Haley Wickenheiser, and our guest today, Marjorie Ross. They went out and showed the boys how good they really were. Thank you. Yes. So, questions for for our pioneer here and for me. I have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, the fact that the hockey kind of died out in the Second World War, and then and from Kingston, the same sort of thing happened in Kingston as well. Uh, but why do you think it didn't pick up when the war ended and then things got back to normal? But it took, seemed to take quite a while before things really built up. For the, for the... I, I think you're right, and it was probably because uh, of the baby boom. Mm -hmm. Because with the returning servicemen, 
and women no longer working in the factories, and 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 then getting married, having children, it just was not a major thing. As I say, my father coached uh, an industrial league team for Montreal Trust in Montreal. There were a lot of women playing at that time, and he had to be begged to to coach the team because there were women in the company that wanted to have a hockey team, and there was nobody that was willing to coach them. So he said he would even though he couldn't skate, but he could open the gate and, and he could organize things. And he actually organized a, uh, a scrimmage at the Montreal Forum on Sunday morning because he had some contacts there. And the girls were pretty thrilled to be playing on the same ice as the Canadians, as the Canadians had played the night before. Uh, hi. Um, I see you, you played in uh, Quebec University in the 1970s. That's right, yes. Um, was there body checking at the time? No, no. And because I remember in the late 80s, they had said that um, Quebec, uh, well, women's hockey in Quebec, they would have body checking, whereas the rest of Canada, they wouldn't. And they said, you know, if you don't want body checking, then you can play a man yet instead. So you didn't have body checking then? Not, not in the university, but there were, maybe there were some other leagues, you know, going on, but. Not in the university. That's one of the reasons I like that so much. Oh, sorry, you, you can body check, but you can't lift your feet off the ice. Oh, that's a that's restriction. That he, you have. I, I go to the Hartwood games all the time. Oh, I, I see body checking and I see them keeping their heads. Okay, well, we didn't even have that. We have a question from back there? Yep. Sure. So, um, I'm glad you brought up the CWHL folding the 200 players. So, yeah. Ms. Ross, if you wouldn't mind, um, the, one of the controversies right now is the 200 players were like, can we get uh, Gary Bettman in to support our league? And Gary Bettman has basically said, as long as there's a professional league, the NHL will, you know, maintain its level of support, as it were. So, uh, for the controversial question, do you agree with trying to pull the the National Women's Hockey League as it currently stands to allow the NHL to support it like the NBA supports their WNBA? Whatever, wh however I think you can get women to continue playing hockey, if that's the only, I'm not a big fan of Gary Bettman, <laughs> but uh, you know, like, if they can keep on playing, you know, but I mean, it's, it's so hard if the only other alternative is the Olympics and to try to get an Olympic team and you're getting Maybe you know twenty of the top, like right across Canada, it must be impossible to choose the best. I, you know, that being said, that that's that's how it gets out the hook this time. Yeah, and yeah. that's all that is. I mean, and so when the other league folds, I mean, what he wants, we want to hear is we're going to do a, a WNBA thing, you know, and we're going to have thirty-two women's teams or sixteen women's yeah. or whatever, and we're yeah. going to do it. He's not said that, nor is there. I, and the, and the, yeah. the NHL, I think, provides or provided two hundred thousand dollars, which is a pittance yeah. given how much the money they've got. I mean, let's face it; we're talking about money here, right? Oh yeah, that's, oh, yeah. That's, that's and sponsors. The problem. And sponsors. And then, like uh, when they had the um, All Star, you know, the skills competition, and a Canadian girl uh, was actually, I think, an American girl right. who ended up winning one of the skills. I don't know which one it was. I think accuracy. Probably. And I think she she only made I think about ten twenty thousand dollars where her male counterpart it was like a hundred thousand yeah. dollars and also she had to give that money she couldn't take it herself I think she had to put it into some sort of uh, you know uh, fund some to, to su support some other team she couldn't take it and put it in her own bank account so it's really hardly fair. Sure, Frank. Uh, I got a question about the future. I, 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 I have daughters playing hockey and all that. But in Toronto, I noticed they got 25 artificial ice rinks. Now, a lot of them are sponsored by companies in, like the Toronto Maple Leafs, I guess. In Montreal, we only have five. The whole West Island doesn't have, you know, global warming's there. That's what I'm looking for in the future. You better have our, our outdoor artificial ice. And, and I know it costs an extra million to put the, you know, the, concrete and the, and the piping and all that stuff. But it's got to happen because the kids can't afford to play, play hockey. Uh, I notice the girls, I go to McGill games all the time. It's wonderful hockey. In fact, the Olympic teams, 
on uh, a majority from one place that McGill uh, three or four of them every year there. Well, I, I don't think. I mean, I I, I, I know Marge and I have watched her play and and I'm a big admirer. So you got to sort of take my opinion with a grain of salt. However, people that I know who are who are really knowledgeable said that with, if there had been an Olympic team or a national team at the time, she would definitely have been on it. And it's a shame that we didn't recognize the game back in those days, so she could have played on that team. Yeah, but then you take, you know, the people who didn't have a chance like 50 years ago or 100 years ago, everything is evolving, you know, particularly for, for women in all different areas. So it's, you know, it's just the way things go. <laughs> Thank you. Do you, do you think that the uh, Canadian universities are able to compete with the American universities in the recruiting the girls? Well, that's, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the girls are going down to the American. American universities, but um, you still, unless you're going to get a full scholarship, it's still expensive. So I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of them go down to Boston College, and because my brother was coaching the Stansted girls team, which is considered one of the best high school teams in uh, in Canada. I think it was ranked number one. I have a couple of girls who played for national teams like under 18 and stuff, and a lot of them are going to Boston and Northwestern, I think, oh, and a few other, a few other universities, but yeah, I think it is hard for them, but you know, I think it's, as I say, even if you get a scholarship in the American universities, in most cases, you still have to pay like maybe 50% or, which is more than a lot of people can afford. By the way, I wanted to say March lives in the townships, and yeah. so uh, Sherbrooke, and yeah. very familiar with Sherbrooke. Yeah. Okay, um, I would like to know uh, who was or who were your sources of inspiration as a hockey player. My brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted my father's admiration, so boom. Yeah. You know, like it was my brother who was a year older than I. No professionals. No, no, way. no. I like Dollard Celeron because I thought he had a cool name. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ms. Russ, you were a multi-sport athlete based on Andrew's yes, presentation. Yeah, yeah. How passionate were you for hockey compared to swimming or the other sports you played? How well? How I, I was. I really was passionate for swimming, but um, it was my my favorite team sport. And then when I was in university, it was nice like that. Most of the other sports that I was involved in was, were individual sports. So I was very passionate, like, and then, as I say, in university, it was the camaraderie, sitting around the locker room and, and things like that. So. I didn't know that you won the Athlete of the Year at Concordia for basketball and hockey. No, no, volleyball. Volleyball, because it's got <laughs> basketball on the web. Oh, no, By the way, I'm going gonna, gonna to embarrass Marge with a story, which is in the book, but, but I didn't I, really include this. So Marge was coming back from the MAA for swimming practice with her brother, Doogie. No, I was by myself. Oh, you're on your phone? Because Doogie's only here with you. Oh, Doogie's lying. You're not lying. You missed out there. So, so, so I have to tell her about her because she won't tell the story. Okay. So, so a guy, it was kind of tight quarters on the bus, uh, on the 105, if anybody knows that. This is the bus that goes along Sherbrooke Street. And a guy roped her. And she turned around and straight on broke his nose. And, and apparently the guy was just completely like flabbergasted, got off the bus, and the next week, now was Doogie with you on the next week? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so the next week, this guy's on the on the same bus, and he's wearing this contraption. <laughs> he broke his nose. No, I knew the second, like, the second shot I gave, I, the first one got him here, and the second one, right, and then I heard it crack. But you know, I travel that bus, every day to swim practice and like there always there was always jerks like that you know and they'd sit down beside you and as a you know 12 13 14 15 year old girl you're too embarrassed to say it, to do anything you know like really i should have just yelled get your hands off me but as i say i was very shy and i didn't you know <laughs> but i was just so fed up at this point i just did it <laughs> she was a legend in our town well, yeah. My brother actually went and did the, his show and tell, <laughs> and then that's what he, you know, he had his show and tell at the school uh, the next week, so that was what he told. <laughs> Bill. Marjorie, could you talk a little, uh, you, uh, Andrew mentioned you went to uh, the Northwest Territories, could you talk a little bit about your career, Northwest Territories, and then after? 
Sure, I was. I, ta I went. Uh, I was teaching in Upper Westmount, which was quite a change. And then I decided I needed a change, so I went up to the Northwest Territories uh, to a small town called Fort Wrigley on the Mackenzie River, fly-in community, 125 people when everyone was off the trap line. So it was a big change, and they did have an outdoor rink there, but it was you couldn't really skate. And then I ended up going down to. Um, teaching in Fort Smith, which was a bigger center, and I played, um, I played um, senior, um, old-timers hockey, but most of the, like, I was the only girl, and some of the guys quit. They weren't too happy, you know, to have a female. And I remember there was, was one guy, than them, probably. and one guy who, I mean, he, he didn't get off, he didn't take a break, he didn't take, go, get off the ice at all, you know, like, it was, it was funny, anyhow, but I, so I was up in the north for nine years, and then um, came back down, and my, I wanted to continue hockey again, and I, my brother said, the best players, the best skaters on the rink are referees, so I took some uh, refereeing, I think I got my level three or whatever, and uh, then I started playing again, and then I went to a taught in, to teach in Bermuda for about uh, seven years. And I came back and continued hockey again. That was a little bit of my history. She hung him up last year, right? Yeah, I, and I, I cried, I sobbed. I am waiting for a hip replacement, so we're just getting too <laughs> She'll much. She'll be back. And the, girls, and the girls, when I left the ice, they, you know, 14 of them on each side with their raised sticks. Mm. So I sort of had to go through the tunnel. I was just weeping. But, you know, life goes on, and that's it. Good for you. Back there. Yeah, Marjorie, uh, while you were playing with uh, McDonald College, uh, was there any U.S. Uh, girls hockey presence? Did you ever play against uh, um, any institutions from the States? No, well, when I was at Loyola, that's where we started, the, we went down and played like Cornell, Brown, some of the Ivy League schools. But when I was out at McDonald College at that time, there weren't, we weren't playing against uh, and then there was a Boston Massport Jets, which were really strong, and they whipped us. But uh, we were pretty competitive with the Ivy League schools, Brown and Cornell and Yale, places like that. Yeah. It was part of the Guild of McDonald College. That's right, yes. Yeah. But when, no, when I went to McDonald College and then at the end of my career, I was at McGill. So, uh, but we did most of our, like, I laugh now, our big, Field, you know, one of our, our big trips would be at the end of the year, and we'd either go to Toronto or go down to Brown. I mean, certainly now the girls go, you know, to Europe, down to Florida, and stuff like that. But it's it's a different time. Yeah. So that's uh, keeps us under the time and gets, oh, gets you back on, on track. Thanks right. very much. Thank you.